views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. I'm George Bodarkey, News Director of WFUV. That's the NPR affiliate station based on the Rose Hill campus of Fordham University in the Bronx. And this is Bronx Connections, a joint initiative between WFUV and BronxNet Television to provide thoughtful and insightful coverage of the borough. In this episode, we're going to find out about the state of the Bronx River, new water quality results are in. We're also going to hear about how the Port Morris Distillery quickly pivoted from making alcohol to making hand sanitizer in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. But first, let's dip our toes into the mighty Bronx River. The Bronx River has seen tremendous gains over the years, thanks to strong partnerships between government and community. But can budget cuts in the face of the coronavirus outbreak weaken those gains? I pose that question and a bunch of others to Michelle Ludke. She's Director of Environmental Stewardship at the Bronx River Alliance. Here's my interview. The Bronx River has seen tremendous gains over the years thanks to strong partnerships between government and community. But can budget cuts in the face of a coronavirus outbreak weaken those gains? Well, we are going to ask that question and also find out more about the state of the Bronx River right now with my guest, Michelle Ludke. She is Director of Environmental Stewardship at the Bronx River Alliance. Michelle, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here today. And I brought the Bronx River to us. It's my favorite topic. <laughs> so how would you describe the state of the river? Um, well, uh, so in, in 2019, um, well, actually, let me back up. We have a number of different community science projects, and those are really opportunities for people from the community to get involved um, and really help steward the Bronx River. And so we do that in a number of different ways. We have one program called Project Waste, and that is an acronym for Waterway and Street Trash Elimination. Um, and so we have the results from, from that. That's cool um, to hear the have, data, right, Michelle? Yeah, exactly. And then we have another program called Project Water Drop, and that is another acronym that stands for Detecting River Outfalls and Pollutants. And that's really our water quality monitoring program. And so we just recently um, released our, our big results from 2019. We're very excited to share with people. Um, and we're also, we wanted to be, very, uh, be cognizant of when we are releasing this, that we're thanking everyone for having volunteered with us in 2019. And, um, and we understand that they're not able to come out and volunteer with us right now, but we are, um, we are thinking about ways that we can get people to be involved. And so we're currently coming up with some ideas for that. So stay tuned if you're interested in volunteering, there will be opportunities for um, appropriately safe, social distanced, um, sort of on your own volunteerism um, that then we'll just record the results of how many people and how many bags of trash or uh, invasive plants they pulled. But, but yeah, that, for the people who want to find a way to give back to the essential services that parks provide and that our essential workers, our parks employees and our colleagues at the Bronx River Alliance, they've been working this entire time. They've been in the parks picking up garbage, picking up masks and gloves that people have dropped on the ground or dropped in the park. Um, and, they're, and they're really short staffed. So we thought, well, what a better way to really harness the power of the Bronx and really mobilize the community to say, as you're starting to come back out and as you are experiencing the beautifulness that is the park, can we think about giving back to our essential workers and these park workers? So if you don't have a sewing machine and you can't sew a mask and you aren't a doctor and you're not on the front lines, this is a way that you can help preserve that frontline work um, and really just um, 
help out our essential workers and our essential services that the parks provide. Um, so, so with that, we wanted to let people know the state of the river. Yeah, that's um, really great to hear though, that you're moving forward with those efforts and thinking about ways to help to continue to clean up the river, even in this age of social distancing, because I know how much you have relied on those in-person cleanups where everyone is coming together. Exactly, exactly. But you know, with the beauty of social media and smartphones, you can hashtag away and tag us with your bags of trash and show us what you personally collected. And then we will add them all up together and then we can celebrate that as a collective whole. So speaking of trash, what did the 2019 data tell you? Well, we had a really big year in 2019. Not only did we do um, street trash for the first time, we also have our data from um, partners up in Westchester County who have installed trash booms as well in the river. So, so what we do, just a little bit more information about what Project Waste is, um, we have um, trash booms in the river and they are literally like big floating bananas in like a circle or like a, like a half moon in the river. And as the water flows, it catches all the floating trash. And so then we get people in waders and we go out and we pick every single piece of trash that comes out of that boom and we tally it um, because it's a scientific study. And we've been able to document a number of um, different uh, trash coming down. And so then we're able to basically modify our advocacy and our education and our outreach efforts to the communities depending on what it is that we're seeing um, and 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 the biggest thing that happened in 2019 is that we surpassed 200,000 piece of trash removed from the river which is pretty exciting um, and all told that's about seven tons of of trash wow. that we have tallied but we have we have pulled more than that out of the river but that is what we have exactly tallied so we know what that number of items equates to that weight and volume mm -hmm. of trash removed um, and so the system that we basically have in the river now is that we have, there are two trash booms up in Westchester County that our parks at Westchester Parks Foundation run. And then we have our trash boom at the border. And so those three are actually catching the Westchester trash. Mm -hmm. We've just split it into thirds. Um, because for those who are not familiar with the different types of sewer systems we have in New York City, there's really two different kinds. There's the combined sewer, and that one gets a lot of, of um, information about it, right? A lot of people have been talking about CSOs or combined sewage overflows. Or all the heavy it, rainfall, right? Exactly, exactly. So the heavy rainfall goes down into the storm sewer. And in a combined system, the storm sewer and then your sanitary, which is your sinks and your toilets and things, all combines into one pipe and goes to the wastewater treatment plant. And then that all gets treated, which is good because storm water is not clean, right? Water that, that falls on our streets and runs down the drain has trash and has all the roadway debris. And if somebody hasn't picked up after their pet, it has fecal waste, just the same as humans have fecal waste. And so in a combined system, all of that goes to the wastewater treatment plant. Really great idea. The problem is, is that we have so much pavement in New York City that we don't have any ability for this storm water when it rains to actually go into the ground again. It just runs down into the storm drain. So the more pavement we have, the more storm water we produce, the more storm water we produce, the more likely that the wastewater treatment plant is going to get overwhelmed. And so before they get overwhelmed, they have these particular pinch points that they are, are permitted to release from. And that's what a combined sewer overflow flow is. But in the rest of the city is what is called a separate storm sewer system. And that is sometimes called an MS4. So if you have ever heard that, 
There's no magic behind that name. It just stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. So that's where you get the MS for. So that's just a separate system. And so that means that anything that falls on your street, it, we have, whether it's trash or copper from your car's brake pads or detergent or dog waste or anything goes straight down the storm drain and it goes directly out to the river. It's not filtered, it's not screened, nothing. So that is what's been going into the Bronx River. So all of Westchester County in the Bronx River watershed and then most of the upper Bronx is all separate storm sewer. The rest of the Bronx is combined sewer. But our combined sewer um, inputs aren't until the estuary part of the river, which is the lower three miles or so of the river. And the Bronx River is 23 miles long. Mm -hmm. So 18 of those miles are in Westchester County. So, mm -hmm. so that's just to give you a little uh, uh, overview of what the watershed looks like. So now when we're looking at the results and we're talking about that, it's a little bit more understandable why we're seeing what it is we're seeing. So when we're looking at that trash and why we're so interested in Westchester County's trash is because that trash is not getting filtered or screened or anything before it from when it goes on your street to into the Bronx River. Now in the city, even though we have most areas are combined, in our MS4 areas in the city, there are things called floatable caps and different catchment basins that allows the trash that washes into the storm drains to actually fall to the bottom and then it can be cleaned out. But that's not the case in Westchester County. There aren't catchment basins and there aren't really even grates because of unwillingness or, um, or unknowingness um, and so what we're seeing is massive, massive amounts of trash getting into the Bronx River in Westchester County. And most of that is styrofoam. It's, um, so we're talking about your cups and things like that, styrofoam cups. That your styrofoam cups, your Dunkin' Donuts, your styrofoam takeaway containers, all of that. Over 60% is, um, is styrofoam. And, um, and then the rest of that is basically plastic. Um, so, and then the only other honorable mention is cigarette butts. Mm -hmm. And that's what really came up on our street trash surveys is that if you ask somebody, um, uh, most people, you know, would you litter? Most people would say, no, I would never litter. But if you say, would you drop a cigarette butt on the ground? Well, sure, I'd do that if I were, a, you know, if I smoked. Yeah. Yeah. Because somehow a, a cigarette butt has stopped being equated to litter. Although from the perspective of a riverine animal, um, a cigarette butt is quite possibly the worst thing because of all the chemicals in the filter mm -hmm. and the fact that the filter breaks down and... Um, and it starts looking more and more like food in the water. And so cigarette butts are something that we found very much in um, on our street trash surveys and then always find in the river. Let's talk about the wildlife in the river because the yeah. river does have quite a bit of wildlife. We even have otters back in the river, right? Yeah, and, and beavers. Um, and there are about 35 different species of fish. Um, and just so many birds, so many birds. Um, I, I don't even know all the number of birds. Um, I would assume it's, I would assume it's more than the number of fish that we have, um, or fishes rather. When you have different species of fish, it's fishes. Uh -huh. there's, there you go. there's a little tidbit for your audience. Yeah, and I said otters. Perfect. I said otters. Yeah. Are there otters and beavers or just beavers? I, uh, I would assume there probably are some otters because otters love beaver dens. I haven't seen an otter in a while, but I have seen muskrat. Um, I was walking with a colleague one time doing water quality and we were in muskrat cove and she just said, 
you know, I've never seen a muskrat and it's called Muskrat Cove. And all of a sudden we saw a muskrat swimming in the water and it was just as if she had uh, conjured it up out of nowhere. It was beautiful. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, and so that's the other thing. And so we have, we have really important runs of, of fish, uh, of fishes actually, of American eels, which is a kind of fish not related to an electric eel. Um, and um, and um, uh, alewife, which is a type of river herring. And those both migrate. So um, they're known as diadromous fish. So they, um, um, the, the alewife lives most of its life in the ocean and then comes back in to spawn. Um, and so we have been stocking more alewife um, in the Bronx Zoo, above, right around where you're, where you are. Uh, yeah, well, we're okay. Yeah, I'll yeah. right about this uh, this location. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so we've been stocking alewife, and we have a fish ladder to allow them to get up over our dams, um, so that they can return to their native spawning ground. And then we also have American eels that spend most of their life in freshwater, and then they go out to the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, to spawn and then their babies will eventually make it up um, into the Bronx River. And so, um, yeah, so these are things that are very important to us, which is why we have created these two community science projects so that we can help people become better stewards and better caretake their river so that our restoration projects of um, doing fish monitoring and fish stocking and, and um, forest restoration that that really that these can be functional for the wildlife that were original to the area and that's really what we're hoping to do that create a natural system even in a highly urbanized area like the Bronx. Yeah and all of this wildlife speaks to the revitalization the work that's been going on over the years because the river was once certainly not as clean and healthy for wildlife as it is today as we talked about earlier, as I mentioned earlier, there are potential budget cuts that will come as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. Is there concern that budget cuts could potentially undo or at least impact the work that you're doing to keep the river clean? Oh, absolutely, which is why we're talking about ways that we can get volunteers to come out to our parks. Um, budget cuts have really slashed parks budgets. Um, so personnel, uh, hiring is very down for the season. Um, we're not sure what level of seasonals we'll be able to get, which um, for our program, we have uh, conservation crew apprentices. And so those are the ones who actually go out and do all of our restoration work. So our invasive species removal and our native tree plantings and all of our um, rain garden uh, green, infra uh, green infrastructure installations that we do, which is how we help manage excess stormwater by giving it a place to actually go and infiltrate. And we actually build these rain gardens using pollinator plants so that we can help support habitat for our very critical pollinator species, as well as mobilize or, you know, uh, retain a lot of stormwater. Um, and so our apprenticeship program is, is really predicated on having, so, having seasonals um, and parks hiring is down. Um, we just found out today that some of our funding that we usually count on for things like water quality monitoring equipment are, we have to only purchase things related to COVID. Mm -hmm. So um, we're finding our normal, um, our normal activities very um, being impacted and not just because people aren't able to come out with us in big groups because we are trying to address how to do that. Um, and we have converted all of our, um, all of our in-person content, we're converting all of that into virtual content. So if you tune in to our Facebook or Instagram stories at noon every day, um, during the week, you're going to find out something a little bit more uh, about the Bronx River. Mm -hmm. um, we have Teaching Tuesdays and Wildlife Wednesdays, and we have Foodway on Monday, and we have the Greenway blog on Friday. And on Thursdays, you can tour different parks and, and meet different people working in this field. 
Uh, we had a tour of River House, our brand new facility in Starlight Park that we're all super anxious to get into as soon as we can leave our homes. Um, and so, yeah, so we've been, we've been really scrambling, but um, I've been super proud of all of the work that we've been doing to try to get people content in their homes so that students can have some at-home curriculum that they can work on and that educators have a resource. Um, and so we've been giving them a lot of the data that we've been collecting so that their students are working with real world data sets um, and they can help us with analysis and visualization and, um, and really making impactful outreach content for our networks. So we've been, it's been a challenge, but it's also been a really great opportunity to really get creative and see what else that we can do to help meet the needs of our community. Because we've been, because we've been under lockdown now for a while, do you anticipate that there will naturally be less litter in the river because fewer people are out tossing trash onto the street? Is that at least maybe one bright side here? I wish that were the case, but what we're actually seeing is people being negligent with their with their PPEs. Mm. And so we're seeing more gloves and more masks on the ground, in the streets, in the storm drains, in the, uh, in the parks. Um, we haven't seen it in the river as much, but we also don't have our trash boom in right now because we don't have anybody to manage it. Um, so it will be interesting to see what the downstream impacts of um, of us not having our booms in and not doing our normal work to see if that has a bigger impact um, in that last downstream boom that the city maintains. But as you said, and as we've been saying throughout this pandemic, we're all in this together. We all need to do our part. Staying home was part of that. Helping to clean up the river is another part of that, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and we... Um, Right, and so so if um, we're thinking about other ways of getting involved too, not just picking up trash, that maybe we pick an invasive species of the week and we um, ask you to go, if you're confident in your identification and you know the difference between a nettle and a poison ivy and a, and a Japanese knotweed, then, then maybe there'll be more opportunities in the future. Um, but yeah, we won't be there to be able to say, nope, that was a nettle. You need to go yeah, find so some <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Michelle, what's the website for people to find out more information? Uh, BronxRiver.org. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Michelle Lubke is Director of Environmental Stewardship at the Bronx River Alliance. Once again, more info at BronxRiver.org. In March, the Port Morris Distillery went silent. Their usually busy tasting room and bar area were empty, as were the stills used to make their specialty liquor, called Pitoro. After several weeks at home, co-owners Billy Valentin and Ralph Barbosa recognized a major need in their Bronx community. So armed with a recipe for liquid hand sanitizer from the World Health Organization, they got back to work. Bronx Connections' Elliot Chaparelli talked to Valentin about what the company is doing to survive and their commitment to their neighbors in the Bronx. Elliot Chaparelli with WFUV News. Bronx businesses are stepping up to respond to the coronavirus pandemic, including the Port Morris Distillery. Joining me today is founder Billy Valentine for our collaboration with BronxNet Television called Bronx Connections. His distillery makes a Puerto Rican moonshine called Pitoro, but right now they're also making hand sanitizer. So let's start from the beginning. How did Port Morris Distillery get started? You're using a family recipe, is that correct? Yes, yes. About nine years ago, we, we pivoted from another business that we had here in the Bronx. And um, Rafi came up with the idea that we should do um, Pitorro in the United States, you know, legally. And um, I thought in the beginning it was a crazy idea, but um, we researched and we found that there was five legal distilleries in New York uh, State. Um, so we, uh, we Googled different uh, uh, people and we were able to start the process like quite quickly. We started um, filing for our licenses. It was just a conversation and that conversation took off within weeks. <laughs> um, so Pitoro is Puerto Rican moonshine, correct? 
Um, yes. What does that mean and how does it differ from other alcohol we might be familiar with like rum or vodka or whiskey? So, so our process is, is different. We use, for our fermentation process, we use any fruits that are in season at that particular time in Puerto Rico. And after the, the fermentation process is done, we do the distilling process. And after the distilling process, um, most of us, most people that know Pitoro use it and infuse it with fruits. Um, so whatever fruits you like um, or your family is, is likes, um, they would take the Pitoro and they would infuse it with that fruit. You know, um, they go as far as doing um, nuts and seafood and meat, you know, so all different types of infusions. Um, so that's what differs. We use it to infuse our, 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 our Pitoro with. So what are some of the infusions you guys offer? Oh, here? Here we have honey, cinnamon, um, pineapple, um, um, passion fruit, uh, coconut. We have a coquito, which is uh, two different flavors. It's, it's a blend of cinnamon and coconut with, with nutmeg. Uh, what else? We have habaneros. Uh, yeah, so we have a bunch of flavors here that you can try. We have, I think we have nine different flavors at the current moment. So how do you change the distilling process um, to make hand sanitizer instead of Pitoro? So the funny thing is we didn't change the distilling process. It's, it's another form of blending. So we're using the same um, form of distillation. And, and at the end, instead of blending for, uh, blending for flavor, we're blending for hand sanitizer. So um, it's just adding different ingredients to our ethanol that makes the hand sanitizer. So if I was blending for, for um, coquito, let's say, or coconut, I would blend down to 92 proof and then I would, I would infuse it with, with coconut and then blend our coconut flavors into our, our, our pitor to make a coconut flavor. The difference now is we're blending down to 160 proof, I believe. And, um, and then we're, we're adding our glycerin, adding our peroxide, and making sure that our, our product ends up at 160 proof, so it's 80% alcohol bottle. So it's just a difference in blending. Okay, so you use the same mash build with the apples? We use the same uh, mash build, we use the same um, alcohol, um, ethanol. Um, we partnered up with, with other locations also, but yes. Um, and at what point did you guys decide to start making hand sanitizer and what made you make that move? So like, like everyone else, um, when this pandemic hit, we shut down our doors completely. So we had 15 employees. We had to lay everybody off, unfortunately, um, around 15 employees. Um, and we all went home and we quarantined. Um, but we started um, realizing that there was a need for hand sanitizer here in the Bronx, at least. You know, um, So there was other of distilleries in, in Kentucky and, and, and a way doing hand sanitizer. So I called Ralphie and I told Ralph, Ralph, we need to jump on this, you know, we're gonna need to do this. Um, but it was a, a economic decision. Um, we couldn't really spend our money right away. The little bit of money that we had that might keep us alive um, to do the hand sanitizer, to give away. It was gonna be difficult. Um, so. As soon as the government and the World Health Organization um, contacted us and said, listen, you guys can start making hand sanitizer because there's a real need for it and you guys can sell it. So that gave us the, the extra motivation we needed because now we can own, not, not only can we make so we can donate, but we can make so we can sell and have enough money to stay alive and donate. Um, so as soon as we got the green light that we were able to do it legally and able to to sell also as well as give away um then we then we jumped on it really immediately um it took us about a week to source all the other materials um you know we had to source the glycerin and we had to source the hydrogen peroxide and as we know everybody in the united states was scrambling for the same um materials so sourcing this 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 these materials was, was difficult but me and ralphie got into a van and you know, every day we drove eight hours one way, eight hours the other way. Um, and we did that for about three days straight, sourcing the materials that we needed to make the hand sanitizer. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and you guys are a small business and those have been hit really hard by the pandemic. You said you had to lay off um, 15 people. As the state looks to reopening, um, what are your plans? 
So, uh, see, see, we're in a tough business because uh, we're a distillery, but we're also a, a place where we, we have food, we have a bar. Um, and I don't think, you know, me personally, I don't think we're going to get open and we're going to, I don't think we're going to go back to, to the norm of what opening supposed to look like. I mean, I, I don't think until, until there's, a, there's a cure or at least a vaccine that's readily available for everyone in the United States, I think not only myself, but any bars and restaurants are going to have a really, really tough time opening up. People are just going to be afraid to, to go back into a setting where they don't know they might get infected. So I think we're going to see a lot of, a lot of businesses that are not going to reopen, um, entertainment businesses like myself. Um, thankfully, you know, we were able to pivot to the left. Um, but if you can't pivot to the left and, and, and do something that's going to keep you alive, I think it's going to be very hard for, for businesses to reopen as the normal. So I'm not sure what, what our future holds um, as far as the Bronx Tavern and the tasting room of our location um, at this moment. Um, but you guys are able to do pickup and shipping uh, for the Pitor. We are able to ship awesome, which is, which is awesome, but we're only able to ship in New York State, um, and that's another thing that, that the governor did for small locations like ours that we're able to ship our liquor um, in the United States. I mean, in um, New York State, if they change the laws and they, they work with small businesses like myself, uh, like my business, and they're able to open up for that, that we're able to ship um, directly to other states. Um, to other people, that means our reach will, 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 our reach will be even more, um, it's easier to reach other people, um, and that might give us a, a way of staying alive for a longer period of time. Um, so I think, I, mean, I think right now we're, we're at the back, you know, we're at um, the mercy of the, the, the lawmakers, um, and, and they have to kind of speak to businesses, business owners like myself, to see what's going to be the best route for small businesses to survive because if we can't reach the amount of people that we have to reach on a daily basis then um, staying alive is going to be hard for not myself but for i think there's like 300 micro distilleries in new york and not only the micro distilleries we're also talking about the breweries as well so if the lawmakers don't come in and say you know there's certain things that we have to do to keep these small businesses uh, alive then there's going to be a lot of small businesses hurting right um, well, thank you so much. Are you able to show us any of your um, distilling facilities right now? Let me show you one minute. I'll show you. Let me see. I'll take you around. So that's Ralphie over there. <laughs> him? I see him waving. Yeah, so he's, he's about to start blending and filling up those, those barrels right there. That's his daughter. She's making boxes. They're about to start being shipped out. Um, that's, that's our boxing area and shipping area. Um, that's his, uh, son-in-law, which does all the boxing. This used to be our lounge where people used to come and entertain. That was that where all those barrels are. That's our stage where we used to have live bands at. And this is our DJ area. Where, you, where I was speaking to you is our bar area. Okay. Now turned into a storage spot for all of our totes. That's my son. And he's the one that handles all the bottling. This is the bottling area. And then this is the, the, the distilling area, which Rafi is starting a mash. So you can kind of see. Let me see if you can. The mash is going. Oh, there's a little porthole. Yeah. So. Is this mash going to be turned into hand sanitizer or into pituaro? So this mash that we're making today is going to be used to make our flavors, our coquito. We've started to run short um, because, thankfully, we're able to ship to New York State. We're getting a lot of orders coming in. So right now, at the current moment, we're, we're making that mash to make our flavors, to make our poquito, make our honey, to make our, our uh, all the different flavors that we make. 
Nice. So that's what he's doing now. Nice. Um, and how much of your um, product turns into hand sanitizer and how much turns into Pitoro? So for the past, for the past um, month and a half or two, uh, since we started, um, it's all been hand sanitizer. We haven't made any um, pitorro for, for flavors or for drinking because we had a pretty good surplus. Um, but now, you know, we kind of started running down our, our, our inventory and we have to start making um, to replenish our, our pitorro. Well, thank you so much for the little tour. I really appreciate it. Um, and I can't wait to see what you guys do next. Awesome. Thanks to Bronx Connections, Elliot Chaparelli, and to the folks at the Port Mars Distillery for all of their great efforts. And that's it for this episode of Bronx Connections. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm George Bodarki. We'll see you next time.